Good morning and a Merry Christmas. And as Scott said, that's coming up this week, isn't it? That's pretty crazy. We want to welcome everyone that's worshiping with us online. We're excited to be together. We are in the heart of December. And, uh, you know, Christmas is just coming up. We can't wait to celebrate that with you all on Christmas Eve. As, we, as we've been planning Christmas, Christmas Eve, uh, you know, as a church staff, as we've been talking about it, as we've been thinking about it for quite some time, what's been pretty interesting is to see as we've gone around the circle and said, okay, what's, what kind of makes Christmas Christmas? Is that Christmas Eve has been this marker for everyone on our church staff that says, okay, Christmas is here. And this has been this marker during Christmas season to say, okay, now it feels like Christmas. And we can't wait to celebrate that with you. As Ella said, we got a 3, 4.30 and a 6 p.m. service. That's coming up this Friday. Last Sunday morning, we started a brand new series titled Hope Has a Name. The name of that is Jesus. And we look at throughout Scripture and we see the hope that is attached to Jesus. And the foundation of this series has come from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah has given this prophecy to God's people. And through the revelation of God, he gives this encouraging message. When God's people felt like, like they were being surrounded... When they felt like their backs up were up against the wall and they, they didn't know if they were going to get through the difficult times that were ahead, Isaiah gives this encouraging message and he uses these names to describe Jesus. These four names, Isaiah 9, 6, and he says he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Those are some four powerful names, aren't they? Wonderful Counselor... Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Those are four powerful names to describe the coming Messiah, the promised child. Now, giving a name to something or someone is difficult. Maybe you've had to do this in your life. Maybe you've had to come up with a name for a business or for a company, and it was, you know, difficult. You, all these brainstorming meetings are trying to come up with what name is best for our business or our company. Or maybe you've had to come up with a name for your kid. Again, that's difficult, isn't it? I think back to the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. When God created, he created everything and he created Adam. And he said, brought all of the animals before Adam to name. Could you imagine having that job? All the animals coming before you and say, okay, what, what, what are you going to name this? What are you going to name that? That would be a difficult job. You know, I think about the naming of our three kids. And maybe you've gone through this process with your family. And, and, you know, when Meredith was pregnant, we'd, you know, go online, baby names for girls or baby names for boys. And you try to whittle it down to see because these are names that will stick with them forever. How's it go with their last name? Do I know anybody else that has this name and what do I think of them? That's a big question. <laughs> you know, teachers have some of the most difficult times coming up with names for their kids. You know, they have hundreds of, of students come through their classroom throughout their career, and each one of them leave a lasting impression. And in their minds, they're like, they don't want to name their child after an annoying kid they had in class, right? For fear they might grow up to be like that. We, for our three kids, we took a classic approach, and we used a family name for all three of our kids. So somewhere in our kids' names, there's a family name attached to it. We want our kids to be reminded of who they are. But we also want to bring honor to the person that we are naming them after. An example of this is our youngest daughter is Evelyn Ruth Sievers. My grandma is Grandma Ruth. So we named Evelyn after my Grandma Ruth. Do you think my grandma calls Evelyn Evelyn? No, she does not. She calls her Little Ruthie. And I'm like, Grandma's not her name, but okay, we'll go with that. Because for her, it's like her mini-me. And she has the spunk that my grandma has, I can tell you that. But all of the names, the difficulty of coming up with names. Last week, we were reminded that through Scripture, there are almost 200 names given to Jesus. 
And all 200 names, or almost all of these 200 names given to Jesus, all have a special meaning to them. And Isaiah's prophecy about the promised child coming, all four of the names have a special meaning to them. They're all powerful. Last week we looked at Jesus as the wonderful counselor. This morning we'll look at Jesus as the everlasting father. That's a little different, isn't it? Sometimes it can be a little bit weird to think of Jesus as an everlasting father. To have the, the title father connected to Jesus. You know, often we think of Jesus, we think of Jesus as the son of God. You know, there's a church word that's used to describe God and the roles of God in Scripture, the persons of God that we see in Scripture. And the term is the Trinity. There are three roles or three persons of God, but there is only one God. We have to be reminded there is one true God. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God. But we see three roles or three persons of God. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And I love the picture that we get of all three of these together at Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized, when we read through Matthew 3, we see Jesus' baptism. We see all three of them present. Let's read that together. And as we read of Jesus' baptism, let's pay close attention to the three roles or the three persons that we see present. Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17 says, As soon as Jesus, as soon as Jesus, there's the Son, was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son. There's the father. This is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. In this event, we see the presence of the son, Jesus. We see the presence of the spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. And we see the presence of the father saying, this is my son. With him I am well pleased. All three present at the exact same time. This makes up the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We link Jesus with the Son. So when Isaiah says, hey, there's, there's a coming. There's a coming of a promised child. And a part of his name is going to be Everlasting Father. It can feel just a little bit different. But I can assure you that is exactly who Isaiah is referencing. See, the title is fitting. The term Father is fitting to Jesus as as the way that he protects us, the way that he guides us, the way that he leads us, the way that he has compassion for us, his children. King David says it this way in Psalm 103, verse 13. He says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. As a father has compassion on his children, just like Jesus has compassion on us. And when we study the Gospels, when we look at the life and teachings of Jesus and the interactions that Jesus has with people on earth, Jesus demonstrates that compassion. He demonstrates that love. He demonstrates that guidance, that protection, just like a father has for his children. And I love the combination of the two words, everlasting and father, that Jesus' love and compassion for us isn't temporary, it is everlasting. God fulfills his covenant with his people through Jesus, and it is never ending. Often the term father was also used to describe a king. It was a royal name. The coming of a king, Isaiah says, is is going to come in in the term of a father. When God's people during Isaiah's time, you know, they felt, they felt the kings around them, other countries kind of, kind of crouching down in on them. Isaiah says there's going to be the coming of a king. And this is going to be a king that is going to reign forever. And of his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. The king is Jesus who is the final king and who fulfills the covenant given to King David that we read about in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He's the final king of the promise given to God's people. 
And this was not only an Old Testament promise that we read about in Old Testament accounts, like with King David, or as Isaiah is saying here, the coming of a king and an everlasting father. But it was also a promise that we see in the New Testament. See, Isaiah's prophecy of the coming of this Messiah, this promised child, this king, is the same type of promise that Mary receives when Gabriel comes to her and tells her that she is with child. Let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and read of this event where Gabriel comes to Mary. Luke chapter 1 starting in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants for how long? Forever. And his kingdom will never end. The promise given to Mary, the night she told she was expecting with child, was the same promise given to God's people through the prophet Isaiah. Now, have you ever looked at the birth accounts? You know, as we get into Christmas, Last week we talked about Joseph. Today we're talking about Mary and how Gabriel appeared to Mary. Have you ever looked at the birth accounts around, surrounding Jesus and thought, you know what, it would be pretty cool to kind of have witnessed that. Imagine if you're just kind of behind the scenes or you're kinda, you get to stand off and you get to see this on display where Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that she is going to be with child in the most unexpected but providential way. I mean, that would be pretty cool to see, wouldn't it? Or maybe there's other times where you've gone throughout Scripture and you're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm reading this battle or I'm reading this event here. And man, Peter walks on water, Jesus walks on water. Like, that'd be pretty cool to see. You know, there are times that when I read Scripture, I'm like, man, that, that, those are pretty cool times. Or maybe you're reading, a, you know, outside of the context of the Bible. Maybe you're reading a history book. Or maybe you're listening to some type of history podcast. Have you ever thought, okay, that would be a pretty cool time to go back and visit? You know, imagine this morning if we had a time machine on stage, then we could all go into this time travel machine. And there we could go to one place in history, one event in history and witness it. Where would you go back to? You know, we all have these thoughts. Maybe they just run, run through our mind, think, okay, it'd be pretty cool to live during that time or, or pretty cool to see this. But you know what? I think that we are living in pretty cool times today. I know some people might think, and, and I can tell by some of the looks on your all's faces. You're like, Austin, do you really understand what's going on in the world? Do you understand what's going on in our society, our country? Yeah, I do. I do. And I think we're pretty blessed. And here's why. We are given a unique perspective. We're given a special lens to see things through. We have the Bible that we can hold in our hands. And because we have all 66 books in our hands, because we hold the Bible, we are given a unique perspective on the events taking place. You know, when we read the Bible, we we open it up, and, and for us to understand what's written in here better, we ask some important questions. We try to put ourselves into the, the shoes of the original audience so we can try to get the original meaning. We'll ask questions like, who wrote the book? Or who was it written to? Or why was it written? Or what are some of the cultural issues of the time that we need to be aware of so we can best interpret the text? And that is good. We should do that. But one thing that we can never remove is the fact that we hold the entire book into our hands. We can't remove the fact that we know how it all started in the very beginning. We can't remove the fact that we know about about Jesus and how it's all going to end. So when we look at Scripture, we look at things that are taking place, we have a unique perspective because we have the entire Word of God. We know, yes, Jesus was born in a manger. Yes, as Jack said, Jesus was the only one that lived a perfect life. Yeah, he did perform miracles. Yes, Jesus did go to a cross. Yes, he was crucified. Yes, he was put into a tomb. 
Yes, he did resurrect from the grave and ascend into heaven. And we know, yes, he will come back. We know these things because we have the Bible. And we're able to link the prophecy from Isaiah to God's people with Gabriel's announcement to Mary. Why? Because we have the entire word of God. We know through the resurrection and ascension that Jesus was the real deal. And church, we are blessed, extremely blessed to know that eternity is a real thing and that Jesus reigns in eternity forever. And because of that, that's what gives us hope. We think of hope having a name. We know of the hope we have in Jesus because of what is written in here. We're blessed to be on this side of history. For people of centuries past have opened this thing up since it's been printed and circulated and, and been able to read for themselves the hope of this promised child and the life that Jesus lived on earth and what the crucifixion and resurrection really mean to us. And so we are gathering hope we are in an eternal relationship with a God who is everlasting. And even Jesus' closest followers on earth didn't get to see the picture that we get to see. Think about that. Jesus' closest followers on earth, the disciples, they didn't get to see the picture that you and I get to see. Yeah, they got to live life with Jesus and see Jesus do some pretty amazing things, and that would have been great. But they didn't get to see the full picture. See, sometimes they had to take giant steps of faith, and sometimes they stumbled pretty hard. You know, after Jesus resurrected from the grave, after he defeated death, which no one has ever done, Jesus walks around with his disciples, showing that he is alive. He eats with them, talks with them, and still they didn't get to see the picture that we get to see. Right before Jesus was to ascend into heaven, they ask him, they say, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking this was going to be an earthly restoration, an earthly reign. But we know an earthly reign is only temporary. Because of Isaiah's prophecy, because of the announcement to, to Mary, that God has a kingdom that is eternal. It is never ending. And because of that, it gives us hope. So when we read the word of God, and we compare that to things that we're going through in life, we are reminded of the, of the hope that we have. We have an everlasting hope because we have an everlasting Father. That's the encouragement that comes from Isaiah's message. The terms everlasting, never ending, forever. Those terms give us hope to tell us, okay, there is something out there awaiting us. Whatever difficulty we might be facing in life right now, out there awaiting us is something greater. Whatever brings us to tears, whatever seems dark or uncertain right now, guess what? Awaiting us is something brighter. And even on the flip side, maybe you're like, okay, Christmas is this week. Everything is all, all good to go. I mean, maybe, maybe life's just putting a smile on your face. Things seem to be going well at home, at work. Everything seems to be just clicking and going really well. Well, guess what? Awaiting us is a blessing still much greater. You see, that's the hope that we have. And because of this hope that we get from an everlasting Father, there is no situation that we find ourselves in on earth. Zero. No situation that we can find ourselves in where we are without hope. So yeah, whatever's taking place in the world or the country or in our personal lives, however dark things seem to be, we have hope because we have an everlasting Father. And I, I just find it very interesting in the context of Isaiah's writing. Again, when, the, when God's people felt like their backs were against the wall, when they felt like, man, this isn't going how I planned. This isn't going how it's supposed to be. I thought we were God's people. I thought we were supposed to be protected. When things started crumbling in on their lives, Isaiah says, hey, one of the four names is the, is the term everlasting. That you will 
on when you get through this, and you will get through this, awaiting is something so good. This isn't as good as it gets. There is a blessing awaiting us that is so much better, and that gives us hope. Recently, I had coffee with a friend of mine. He's a, a, a college student down at Ohio State. He's a senior, getting ready to graduate. And we had coffee, as we do, just every, every so often to kind of catch up. And, and he's telling me about his senior year, telling me about all the things that he's going through. And at the end of the coffee, we, we you know, do something that we normally do. We kind of have a little soul check. He said, Austin, you know, things are really, really busy right now. Um, you know, I'm trying to find a job. and finishing up internships. We've got all these different projects. All the things that you would expect a, a senior in college to be busy with. And he said, I haven't really been involved in the, in the church groups on campus like I have in years past. And, but, but God's doing something. See, some of these projects that I'm involved with, there's people that I'm surrounded with in these projects that they're, un, they're non-believers. Some of them even use the term atheist. And so they converse back and forth. And they ask him questions. And they don't ask him questions. He said, they don't ask me questions that, that you would think an atheist would ask. They don't ask what we would think would be apologetic questions. Like, okay, let's look at creation. How, how did it all go down? Or what's the validity of the Bible? They don't ask these apologetic questions, but they ask him, okay, so you think there's something, you think there's something past your last breath here on earth? Yeah. And so they're, they're questioning, they're wondering, why do you believe this? And as he's telling me this, you know what comes to my mind? I'm reminded of Jesus' words. When Jesus said, I have to go away from earth. I have to leave. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Think about that. The everlasting Father, the promised child, the Messiah, the Savior of the world says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it's, when it's ready, then I'll come back and I'll come get you. To know that Jesus is preparing a place for us gives us hope. That there is nothing that we can be going through here on earth where we are without hope because of our eternal relationship with an everlasting Father. And as we think about Christmas, we are reminded each and every year the birth of Jesus. We're reminded of what he came and accomplished through his death and through his resurrection. And that there is something out there awaiting us that it's going to be so grand, so beautiful, that the Son of God is preparing it for us. Tell me that doesn't give you hope. This Christmas season, let's lean into that hope just a little bit more. You know, as we conclude this morning, I want us to look at two just very practical things that I think that we can all do this Christmas season that will maybe give us a little bit more hope. These are very simple. They're very practical. There's something that we can do today. All right, again, they're very simple, very practical. One is this, engage the Bible. Oh, no, we, remember here, let's be reminded that we have the entire word of God in our hands. Where does our hope come from? It comes from what's written in here. So let's engage with the Bible. We can do that today. We can start this week. This week is Christmas. We can open up in the New Testament and to the birth accounts of Jesus and Matthew and Luke and even the first chapter of John and read the birth accounts of Jesus to prepare us for Christmas. On Christmas morning, let's encourage one another on Christmas morning before wrapping paper goes everywhere, before the hustle and bustle comes in, before you're trying to make sure you got your coffee and you're in your seat and ready to go, before things begin to get opened up. Let's take time and pause and let's, let's read the birth account of Jesus before we start opening up gifts to be reminded of, of why we're doing this, to be reminded of why we get together. My dad did this when we were growing up. Every, every single Christmas morning, we'd stop before we'd get into the, the craziness and the hustle and bustle of opening up presents. We'd stop and my dad would read the birth accounts of Jesus. My grandpa, we would do it with him and his family. So um, your kids were never too old to start this if you, haven't, if you haven't already. My grandpa, we'd go to his house before Christmas and he died seven or eight years ago, and I can still hear in my mind, I can still hear him saying, in the days of Caesar Augustus. He would do that as well. So dads, 
We can, lead in, we can lead in this. We can lead this on Christmas morning. Moms, if you're sitting by your husband right now on Christmas morning, if the gifts start, you know, going first, just give him that look, you know, give him that look so he's reminded, hey, let's open up the Word of God and let, let's read the birth account of Jesus. Even a few verses. Two, we can broaden our perspective. I mean, two things. Engage the Bible and just, just broaden my perspective a little bit. See, so many, so many times we live for what's right here in front of us. And whatever is right here in front of us, whatever we can see, that right there gets all of our emotional energy and all of our emotional attention. And then what happens a lot of times is the highs become really high and the lows become really low because we're so fixed on what we can see. But remember, we have a unique perspective, don't we? We have the Word of God. So when we look at this throughout the scope of eternity, if we look at the scope of what Jesus has done, everlasting Father, it kind of levels this out a little bit. You know, the high highs don't seem so high, and the low lows don't seem so low. The, the Apostle Paul, his life, he did this so well. And the way he taught about in the New Testament, time and time again, we can read the New Testament, some of his letters, and see how he was encouraging the recipients of his letters to kind of broaden their perspective a little bit. And live for eternity. Some of my favorite come out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Let's be reminded of that. That's pretty encouraging, isn't it? Our present troubles are small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So don't look at the troubles we can now see. Rather we fix our gaze we broaden our perspective on things that we cannot see. For the things that we see now will be soon be gone, but the things we cannot see, just like the promise to Mary and Isaiah's prophecy, they will last forever. Engaging the Bible and broadening my perspective are two things that I can do starting today that will help me this Christmas season just to lean into a little bit more hope. To be reminded of Isaiah's words. For unto us a child is born. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We have an everlasting hope because we have an everlasting Father. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much. Our gratitude for you is so great. Lord, we are reminded of your love for us, your compassion for us, your plan for us. Lord, we are reminded that you reign forever, that your kingdom is never ending, that you are the king of all kings, and you have something you are preparing for us for all of eternity, and that gives us hope. Lord, help us to be reminded of that each and every day. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, our everlasting father. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.